I'm honored to be here with people that take science and space travel uh, not as a, a routine comic book or a movie, but something serious. Now I want to present uh, briefly, as I can, the important role that my mother and father and sister played in my particular life and my devotion to science. This is a picture of my mother. She was born in 1906 and uh, was very beautiful and um, loving. I was just saying that my mother was the key and my father to my success. This picture here is a picture of my father. He was born in 1903 and he was also a gifted mathematician. He didn't get the formal credentials that I got, but he was um, sharp, he knew, he taught arithmetic to me when I was like four years old and uh, never lost a chess game, uh, not a chess game, but checker game, and introduced me to um, the beauty of rational thinking, logical reasoning. This is a picture of me when I was three years old. Um, I loved uh, the outdoors, and it gave me um, an appreciation of life. And the love of my mother and father. You see, they were hovering around me like two devoted mothers with an insatiable desire to protect and nature uh, their child at the time, this is me. Now my sister was five years older, she's sitting here, and she went through the same thing I did. This is me when I was, I think, four, and my sister when she was five years older than me, nine years old, and this is my beautiful mother that was devoted, that devoted her life to raising two beautiful children. This is my mother and my father at a hotel in Hollywood, I forgot the name of the hotel, Taken around 1947 or 48, we moved to uh, Hollywood, Los Angeles, California, I believe around 1945, before the end of World War II. And then we moved to Inglewood, California around 1948. You see, my mother, my father loved science, and the famous uh, observatory in the world was located in Mount Wilson. So being uh, a person that loved science, um, frequented that uh, observatory with the family on Sundays. This is a picture of me uh, at the Mount Wilson Observatory when I was uh, maybe nine years old. So I, I was already uh, a fairly advanced student in high school and I decided to study calculus in the 11th grade. So I bought a calculus book that I thought I could study myself and learn calculus. This is when I was, um, well, I forgot the, how old I was, probably 16. This is a, the time I bought it in 1953. I usually, when I buy a book, I put my name on it and the date I bought, I bought the book. This says 1953, so that gives you an idea a bit of the intensity I had for mathematics. Calculus was not even thought about in high school. This is a book that I started to take, to carry, uh, to not to carry, but to create, uh, to record some of the thoughts I had in mathematics while in the 11th and 12th grade in high school. This is not college. These are some of the, well, I'm not going to explain what I wrote, in those, in that book. But this is a, a mathematical concept, mathematical idea. Usually these were, were not known in the fields. And I would get an idea and write it in this book. Oh, uh, I also took physics when I was in the 11th grade. Usually you don't take physics until you're in the 12th grade. Well, with my mathematical background uh, and a a good uh, devotion in my mental out view of life, the seriousness of which I took uh, physics and mathematics, I started to take physics in, in, in the 11th grade, and my physics teacher, Ray Potter, 
uh, saw in me the gift that I had for physics and mathematics encouraged me to uh, take the annual mathematics, it's a state of California competition exam for the top physics students in California. This was uh, after I finished with his, um, taking his class in the 11th and uh, called A11, no, B11, A12, uh, Ray Potter encouraged me to take the exam. I took the exam, passed around the 19th. And usually these uh, people that were in competition for winning, the, the, this is the top student in physics in the entire state of California. That exam was usually taken, I think, at Caltech or thereabouts. I placed very high, not quite getting a scholarship for Caltech. I studied almost uh, six months to win that uh, competition. I, barely, I almost won it, not quite, but um, that prepared me for college. Just studying, devoting my time in the 12th grade to winning this exam. I didn't, but uh, I came pretty close to winning it. Next slide. That, that's my physics teacher, Ray Potter. He put F equals MA. And the, the little inscription that he wrote was best of luck to a super student, Ray Potter. He passed away, but he's right here on the, he's right here in this auditorium. Next slide. This is the next book I bought, The Magic of Numbers. And let's see when this book was bought and who bought it. Next slide. This book was bought by my father and my mother. It was in 1955. Next slide. This book is another one called Men of Mathematics. And uh, I think this book was, was as a gift, bought uh, as a gift from somebody that you might know right now. Next slide to see who did it. This is what my sister wrote in there. Um, I can't read it here, but she essentially is saying, to the professor with love, my uh, Vivian right here. And Vivian is right here, and she probably thought, um, well, maybe my, my brother was uh, pretty smart and liked mathematics, and I buy him this gift. Well, thank you, Vivian, for having that thought. Next slide. I was serious about mathematics and kept buying books on mathematics when I was uh, very young and um, studying. I also became personally friends with the faculty member at almost all the faculty members at UCLA. Next slide. This is now the third one. Uh, that, I think, was 1956. Next slide. What is mathematics? This is already the fifth book. Uh, while I'm still in the, at UCLA. Um, I think I was, this was 1956, I'm not sure, next slide. Uh, it says here, I think 1957. Uh, next slide, another book, The Philosophy of Mathematics and Natural Sciences. So I'm beginning to accumulate um, a library in my bedroom on mathematics. Next slide. I think that says uh, 1957, I'm not sure, when I bought that book. Next slide. Oh, what do we have here? Another book on mathematics, the last problem. Let's see the next slide here. Uh, that doesn't have a date, but that's me. Next slide. This is an important, when I was at UCLA as an undergrad, as a, um, um, I think I was around in the no, the junior year. I think 19. I was in my third year of uh, at UCLA. I took a course called numerical analysis, and um, I wanted to get familiar with automatic uh, digital machines. Well, UCLA um, was the location of a group of people that were doing that had a desire to create the world's fastest computer, a, really a supercomputer. And that became known as the SWAC machine, S-W-A-C. 
This was located in, in, in the northern corner of the uh, University of California, Los Angeles campus. At that time, it was the world's fastest computer, the supercomputer, and that was located in a part of a room where I used to go to study mathematics and physics. Next slide. That's a, a written description of the importance of that machine. I studied, I took a course in numerical analysis and used that machine to uh, code, this is not Fortran, this is before Fortran, it was called machine language to run that machine. So, um, and this was not um, my interest, but it was a formal course in, um, at UCLA called numerical analysis where the students were given uh, assignments to program and run on the SWAC machine, the world's fastest computer. Next slide. Um, I graduated in 1958. There's a picture of my mother and my father, my sister, um, and um, this is in the backyard of the home in Inglewood. Next slide. This is in, in the, next, the following year, I worked at Research Chemicals uh, doing um, uh, physics work, uh, determining the magnetic susceptibility of rare earth elements. This is an electromagnet, very high field. Um, next room was a, um, an XRD diffractometer doing X-ray diffraction measurements. Next slide. And um, because of, that, of the determination of X-ray crystal structure was a trial and error um, situation, I thought, well, is there a way to uh, determine crystal structures without the old-fashioned trial and error, but to do it mathematically? My forte is mathematics. I was young. And I thought, well, I want to learn how the diffractometer is used to, to find the peaks, the, the, the peaks of the spectral diagrams of the crystal held at various angles and use that information to come up with a mathematical uh, method of calculating crystal structures, not a trial and error. Next slide. I wrote a paper that was several pages long. Let's go through this, uh, these very rapidly. Right. This is now it required uh, computing the ratios like 5 divided by 8. No, the, the big number was on top, so it would be 8 divided by 5. Um, now this slowed down. Uh, and that became known to a um, a, uh, a consultant that this firm uh, in Burbank called uh, Research Chemicals hired. Uh, that uh, consultant was working with Linus Pauling at Caltech. Linus Pauling was the world's greatest. Uh, chemist, I, that's my personal opinion, was the first to apply quantum mechanics to uh, problems in chemistry and uh, invited me the next year because he evidently read this paper I wrote on a way to use the spectral information uh, mathematically to determine crystal structures without trial and error, hired me. Now, this was a picture taken in uh, uh, Dr. Linus Pauling's uh, beautiful laboratory uh, at the California Institute of Technology is very really rare because I was a student at UCLA at that time, a graduate student, and uh, usually only uh, graduate students at the uh, California Institute of Technology was allowed to work summers uh, for the professors, and also uh, Linus Pauling was a Nobel laureate. This is called essentially, uh, if we can blow that up, the technical foundation of interplanetary space travel before Minovich's invention of gravity propulsion became known. Next slide. This is a picture of the front cover of a book I bought. I, you know, I love to buy books in a subject. Well, when the space travel, the, the concept of space travel became popular, I started to buy books and go to the library and read about space travel. Next slide. This is by Willie Ray. 
This, the concept of space travel was based on uh, the early pioneers, Chislokowski, um, they worked out the minimum energy trajectory to go from one planet to another, which was a 180 degree um, flight path around the sun from the launch planet to the um, target planet. Next slide. This is a picture of uh, these Holman trajectories, 180 degree minimum energy. It was a conic circle, a conic path, ellipse, that's very, uh, centric if you want to go out to Neptune. This is a, a picture of a, a trajectory to Neptune that required, I think it was 40, 32 years. The launch energy was like 12 kilometers per second. That's hyperbolic excess velocity above orbital velocity. So it takes a very great deal of propulsion to get out there uh, on this minimum energy trajectory. Next slide. This is a book published in 1959. Uh, by Brookhaman, Brookham on space travel. Next slide. 46 years to go to Pluto. That's on the minimum energy and the, la the launch required launch velocity, hyperbolic excess velocity was about 12.1 uh, kilometers per second. Next slide. Uh, this is reading, this is uh, I think a lot in. Uh, Dirk Lawton was the most popular astrodynamicist in the early 1950s, no, the latter 1950s and 1960s, and wrote probably 25 manuscripts um, of space travel, trajectory determination. Next slide. Of course, it was all based on Holman, direct transfer, minimum energy trajectories because to go to another planet required uh, a great deal of hyperbolic excess velocity above orbital velocity, so you're looking at great velocities. Next slide. Uh, this, is a, this is an engineering handbook. Uh, this was 1962, I think, or 61. Next slide. All based on the known, the, all, all the trajectories from one planet to another. It's direct, it's minimum energy, and well known, and you don't tell the professionals you've got a different idea. Uh, this is written in stone. I have several um, illustrations to prove that prior to my invention, there was no such thing as gravity propulsion, gravity assist, because I'm gonna tell you something else that most people don't know that's very important and is fundamentally important to understand the true history of interplanetary space travel. Next slide. Uh, this was uh, Mr. Dr. Professor Rupe, who was a member of the research team with Werner von Braun, worked at Pune Monday in 1944, which the Brits uh, destroyed, which I think was uh, very bad, but uh, the publicity that would be given is they were going to build, uh, well, they were building V2s and stuff, doing bad things about it, but the, the Brits and Americans were doing a lot worse than the, the, the little simple little V2s. Next slide. Uh, this is um, perturbation theory by Herrick, and um, this is a book that, uh, not, not a book, but a paper he wrote on various uh, ideas of space travel. Next page, next slide. And this was a description that if you want to use the moon as a boost, first of all, you couldn't use the moon as a boost because you didn't know the mathematics. Secondly, if you had the right idea to use the moon, it would not be a very practical idea. Next slide. Here's a the reason why it was it would actually be called the guidance necessary to do it, and it would and you didn't know how to do it at the first place because you couldn't solve the the problem um, was um, not only not possible but wasteful. So it was like a trick that you could never benefit from. Next slide. But that was for using the moon. There was no ever any talk about using a planet. This is The Challenge of Space by Arthur C. Clarke, 1959, next slide. And I'm gonna read this statement that I wrote in, I underlined in red. 
It says this up here, um, if I can read it, talking about the possibility of reaching the remoter planets. And this is what he said in 1959 when he wrote this book. The remote, the remote planets, such as Jupiter and the outer planets, could be reached only after many years of travel. And, and so exploration based on chemically propelled spacecraft was an impossibility. So, oh, oh yeah, he says here, only after many years of travel, so the limit of space travel with chemically propelled spaceships is the moon, Mars, and Venus. Now, Arthur C. Clarke was one of the foremost uh, uh, experts on space travel. So he essentially said, out of planet missions with a chemically launched spacecraft is a physical impossibility. It's important in the history of science, space travel, to know that the idea of going to the outer planets with, with chemis, chemically propelled propulsion systems was regarded as an impossibility. Next slide. This was written, oh, Krakow had an idea of using one uh, vehicle to, to go around um, Venus and um, Mars with one mission. Now, since using gravity was an impossibility because it required um, finding a solution to a problem that was unsolvable. He had to eliminate the effect of perturbations. So he designed this by, uh, by using an onboard rocket, rocket engine to cancel out the perturbations of Venus. And when he's going to pass Mars, to use that same rocket engine, put it at uh, Mars and cancel out the perturbations. So he designed one um, select one uh, elliptical path that had a uh, timing critically important to pass the orbits of Mars and Venus precisely as the planet there. He solved the annoying problem of perturbations by using onboard uh, propulsion to cancel out the gravitational attraction. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, written by, oh, in 1925, uh, another early inventor, I think Holman, who invented the, uh, the minimum energy, 180 degree uh, flight path, decided, well, I'm going to now use my 180 degree flight path to visit uh, two planets with one a vehicle and using uh, the rocket engine to cancel out the perturbations of the planets is the way I'm going to do it. And that was 1925. So the idea of multi-planetary space travel was known as early as 1925, but the way that that could only be done was to cancel out the gravitational attractions of the flyby planet you're using. So uh, next slide. Um, early people uh, in uh, science in, in the field of astrodynamics had to use onboard rocket propulsion, aim it at the planet, cancel it out. I'm not going to read this here, but this is what uh, Holman wrote in uh, 1925. It says, the interference of the gravitational field of the passing planet has to be, cons has to be considered. And there's only one way to, to consider it, and only one way to recognize that we've got a problem with these perturbations, and that is onboard rocket take propulsion. So we used about one third of the total uh, capability, spacecraft capability, in canceling out the effects of gravitational perturbations. Next slide. Now this is a, a slide showing how Herman. Um, uh, Holman did it, and this is comparing it with how Krakow did it. The common underlying feature was the use of um, 
onboard rocket propulsion to cancel out the most hated, um, awful thing in space science, and that is gravitational perturbations. Next slide. Uh, this is the exploration of the solar system written in, I think, in 1962. Next slide. It shows that the flight time to go to um, the outer planets and energy was required was many, many, well, I think about, oh, uh, see, 41 years, I think, to get to, well, here, this is space, this is next, I think it was almost 100 years, no, about 50 years to go to Pluto. Next slide. Space flight, 1960, uh, by Eric Kraft Eric is one of the most famous astrodynamicists that ever lived. Let's see what, how he regarded perturbations. Next slide. He wrote a book on perturbations. I'm not going to quote what he said, but he said it's the most serious interference with the concept of interplanetary space travel there is. It's like a hurricane. So you have to learn how to deal with this uh, annoying disturbance. And uh, if you got a, a, get a copy of the book and read what I say in his underlines, you'll see exactly what he said. This is written by the most advanced astrodynamicist that ever lived. I mean, in, I'm not saying that ever lived, but uh, was uh, a leading astrodynamicist. And again, he wrote this in, uh, I think, 1960 when he published this book. Next slide. Again, this is the next page showing uh, that uh, you've got to solve this problem. Next slide. It's another uh, gentleman who proved that the 180 degree Hallman trajectory was the minimum energy trajectory. And if it's the minimum energy trajectory to go, with the, to go on a uh, mission to Pluto with a, a Hallman trajectory required um, a half a century. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, another book by Kraft Erke in 1962. Next slide. To go to, well, these are all the ways you can go to a planet, target planet, all possible flight paths. Uh, the energies are accompanying this. The whole 180 degree was the most economical. We're looking at uh, the required propulsion, uh, it's called ejection propulsion from a low Earth orbit. Next slide. These are the numbers that he. Uh, required that were required to um, achieve the mission. I think it was uh, 94 days for a round trip to Pluto. Next slide. Uh, this uh, underline here is uh, interplanetary flights involving several planets, uh, published by Eric back in 1962. I underline it in red because it's a section devoted specifically to multi-planetary trajectories. Let's see how he deals with planetary perturbations. Next slide. Right up here, you read that he says we solve the problem by using onboard propulsion to cancel out the effects of gravitational perturbations if you want to carry out a multi-planetary mission. You can buy this book in any big, uh, or you can see this book in any big library published in 1962. Next slide. Um, Lockheed started a big project in June of 1962 on space travel and had a chapter on multi-planetary trajectory determination. Let's go to the next slide. And if you read this paragraph, he said essentially that it's uh, very serious and the only way it could be done is with nuclear propulsion. You can't do it with a chemical spacecraft. Next slide. This is, uh, I think, oh, this is written by a, a name Barr, and it was an analytical proof that the Holman type transfer uh, is the true minimum energy transfer trajectory to visit another planet. The 180 degree constant half conic trajectory was the minimum energy trajectory, and this was like the Bible 
uh, in the early 1960s. I underline it in red. You can get this in the um, professional literature. Next slide. So this is uh, how outer plan, um, if you want to go above the plane of, uh, the ecliptic plane of the um, Earth orbit, uh, out of the um, uh, normal to the uh, plane of motion, uh, you have to go, uh, the energy required to get up like 20 degrees above the ecliptic plane is, uh, requires nuclear propulsion, can't do it any other way. Next slide, again, this is all in the mathematical literature. Uh, now, the person who is regarded as still today as the most um, professional uh, astrodynamicist that ever lived, or at the time, the latter 50s and early 60s, was Lawden, D.F. Lawden. He wrote a, published a book called Optimal Trajectories for Space Navigation based on using a very advanced field of mathematics called the Calculus of Variations. My sister is sitting right here, bought me a book on the Calculus of Variations when I was, a, I think, I was in college. But uh, it's a very beautiful branch of mathematics and he used, he was a professor of mathematics, and used the most powerful tool uh, in mathematics to get minimum, um, to get minimum uh, equations, minimum, to design things that would give you the least uh, way to do it, ge geometrical way to do it, devoted that power to, uh, to work out all the flight paths requiring minimum energy for interplanetary transportation. It's titled it Optimal Trajectories for Space Navigation, over 100 pages long. That you can find in the library also. Next slide. Um, this is one of the sections that he published in that book. Next, uh, next slide. Navigation Guides for Space. Next slide. Another paper. Going to Pluto. 50 years, half a century out of the question. Next slide. Uh, 1964. Next slide. Out of the question. 50 years. Go to Pluto. Third, 35 years to get to Neptune. Next slide. DF Lawton again, interplanetary trajectories. Well, what does he say? about uh, going to the outer planets. Next slide. Next slide. He says here the only way to go to uh, planets beyond Jupiter is nuclear propulsion. This is D.F. Lawton, one of the greatest astrodynamicists that ever lived. No, no, no. Yeah, this was written by D.F. Lawton, uh, one of the greatest astrodynamicists that ever lived. So you see, treating the effects of gravitational perturbations was one of the most uh, serious problems to achieve interplanetary space travel to another planet if another planet is giving you the gravitational interference, which they called interference. Next slide. You said you need nuclear propulsion. This is done by Professor, oh gosh, I, Oh yeah, Kraft, no, Theodore von Karman. Now Theodore von Karman was a professor at the California Institute of Technology, a uh, very brilliant man, and let's see what he wrote uh, regarding the possibility of visiting the outer planets. Next slide. Uh, I won't quote him directly, but he says the only way that you can get to the outer planets is by nuclear propulsion. Next slide. So, when the whole fervor around 1959, 1958, with the battle between America and um, Russia, is who's going to be the world, the, who's going to build a vehicle that will be able to explore the solar system, and it can only be done by nuclear propulsion, then they started giving hundreds of millions of dollars to uh, um, Lockheed and uh, the uh, physics laboratories and everything to study nuclear rockets. Next slide. 
There's another one, Advanced Reactor Design for Nuclear Propulsion. Now, you see, this is very important, how to get to the outer planets, the only way that it was considered possibly, technically possible, was nuclear propulsion. You can go to a library, and I, I would encourage you to read this literature so that you can counter so that you can see that this is never discussed in the, in, the, in, in the history of science today. Go to the next slide. Nuclear rockets and the space challenge. If you want to go and visit the outer planets, which is 90% of the solar system, you've got to go to nuclear propulsion. Next slide. Rift. This is a picture of a nuclear propelled vehicle. Next slide. This was written in... Uh, I think it was 19, oh, I don't remember the date. Oh, ha, this was written at JPL. How are they going to do it? Nuclear propeller, unmanned spacecraft. Next slide. And this is uh, essentially a chart saying that beyond Jupiter, it is a technical impossibility without nuclear propulsion. Jet Propulsion Laboratory, 1962. Remember that. Keep a record of what I'm telling you because it's very important if you want to get an accurate picture of the history of space travel. Next slide. Uh, this is essentially what the man says or what that JPL report says. You cannot do it without nuclear propulsion. Next slide. There's a picture now. You want to go to nuclear propulsion? You want to go to the outer planets? These are, these, these are the rockets you've got to build to do it with nuclear propelled upper stages. So not only do you need big launch vehicles, this is a picture of the Washington Monument uh, to do it, but you need nuclear propulsion. I don't know how much money this is going to cost. This is Saturn V, the moon rocket here in comparison to the rockets required to go to the outer planets. This is a supernova. That's a nova. The nova was the launch vehicle used on the Apollo. Here's the uh, smaller launch vehicles, uh, Atlas. And here's the Atlas Centaur, very small. This is an equation that determines the payload for capability for any vehicle that has an exhaust velocity, U, and they require delta V. You can look it up, but uh, that's what it is. This is a, of the ratio of the mass after burnout, uh, no, the, the mass before burnout divided by the mass um, after burnout, and that's a very large number if you want to do these missions. Again, this is with a fairly large payload, if you want to do it, this is the enormous, this, the, the mass of this vehicle at launch is bigger than a, a like a Navy destroyer, or maybe even a, um, a small aircraft carrier. Go to the next slide. This is a picture of a nuclear propelled spacecraft, the JPL production, 1963 or 62. Next slide. This was uh, a launch, com not a launch complex, but this was a complex built to test nuclear propulsion systems in Nevada. And I can tell you there's an embarrassing fact about this facility. You can go, you can find these articles in the literature. I think this is published 1964, when they were really putting big dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars to build these nuclear propulsion systems. This is a nuclear power plant and uh, had a nuclear reactor, and uh, you fire this thing up, and you get a very high radioactivity that was go going all over the southern part of Nevada. Now, you won't find that very many times in the newspapers, but they were essentially so fanatical about nuclear propulsion, so believing that nuclear propulsion was absolutely necessary to go to the outer planets, that they were devoting almost a billion dollars in the effort. Next slide. This is a picture of the launch complex for nuclear propulsion. Next, next slide. Nuclear propulsion. And the destruction that they were doing to Southern Nevada um, environmentally wise with the uh, 
with all the exhaust products, highly radioactivity is never mentioned, but there are places near Mercury, Nevada, where you can't even go. And that's not far from, La from Las Vegas. Howard Hughes uh, had, a, had a big operation there, and he was uh, trying to interact with the um, um, people that were testing in Nevada to try to shut it down. He was not the crazy people that was portrayed in the movie. He was a very intelligent uh, person who uh, devoted his life to advanced aviation. Next slide. Now, we're getting next to realizing that not only nuclear propulsion was not possible, but electric propulsion was not possible either. And this is the first sign that they are having a problem with nuclear ion propulsion. I think this was 1964. Next slide. So it says here, nuclear rockets, flight systems deferred. Why? Not because of the environment destruction, but because they couldn't do it. The temperatures involved were mint melting the nozzle. So you, and and the, the amount of radioactivity, which they never mentioned, was horrendous. Next slide. Uh, this is a continuation of that article. I think it was published in 1964. Next slide. Uh, let's see. Nuclear flight programs canceled as President Trump's 1995 budget. This was published in 1994. Sixty-four, and this is when it was becoming known how stupid, not stupid, how, how dangerous nuclear propulsion was, number one, and number two, the fact that it was an impossible thing. It was like science fiction. You read the comic books, everyone had nuclear propulsion. Well, when you try to put nuclear propulsion in an operating system, you'll find you, you melt the nozzle. So um, they decided to terminate that program. Next slide. In fact, it had to be terminated. Oh, is that the end of that? No, here it is. Nuclear programs canceled as President Trump. Well, that's just a blow up of the other one. Go to the next slide. It, we might be coming close to the end of that section. Okay, go into the next section now. This is my third presentation. The invention of gravity assist multiplanetary trajectories. I want to read this briefly. The invention of uh, of gravity assist multiplanetary gestures was one of the most difficult inventions ever invented. And I'm not bragging about what I'm going to tell you now. Gravity propulsion is dependent on a problem that was believed to be unsolvable. In fact, it was unsolvable. That problem is very famous in the history of mathematics called the three-body problem of celestial mechanics. That involves determining the trajectory of, a, of an object, body one, moving in the vicinity of another body that is gravitationally affected by another body. So we have three bodies, and the, uh, the problem is to study, is to work out a mathematical formula that will determine the trajectory of each of these, in particular the smallest one. So if you want to use uh, Venus in a way that will direct the out after you you interact with Venus with the sun affecting the motion of both the planet and the space vehicle. You had to solve the problem. That problem was unsolvable. So doing what I was proposing to do was impossible. It was more impossible than hardware. It was a mathematical impossibility, like trying to jump from your state or trying to press a button and have an effect that and nullify the, the effect of gravity and go up to the ceiling. That's how impossible it was. My invention was a way to do it by solving the three-body problem. Not the way the solution was presented, but by a way that could be done with a method called numeric, by a method called, um, oh, let's see if I can remember this. It's a numerical way to do it by iterations. Next slide. This is a picture of a, the three-body problem. Microphone. This is a, um, the sun. This is a vehicle here. This is a, a planet. 
and you want to go to another planet. But you have here the effect of this planet here, and you have the sun here, so you have this vehicle moving under the simultaneous influence of two major bodies, the sun and the, the planet. So the problem is, well, if you want to go to, a, to another planet here, you have to know how to approach that planet. You're wasting your time, many bits, because you, the problem you're, you're trying to, uh, to find a solution for, the three-body problem does not exist, so I don't waste my time. But that's what, I, that's what I thought could be solved. And I drew this, I think, well, go, let's go to the next slide. Men of mathematics, I think, the next slide, I think this is uh, a gift from my mother or my father. Next slide. Oh, we're getting into more treatises on, and this is the books I was buying on mathematics, not to solve the three-body problem, but just to read the p picture, uh, the mathematics. Now, this is very important. The reason why I injected this is because if we go to the next prob next page, it specifically addresses the three-body problem because the three-body problem in the history of science, and uh, history of mathematics, was really important, and it occupies a very important place. Could you go to the next slide? This is what, essentially, Whitaker said. The three-body problem is the most is the most difficult problem in the whole history of mathematics. Next slide. Another book by a Russian. This was published in 1967. The three-body problem can't be solved. And uh, I'm trying to convince her that what that when I solved it numerically, I, was, I didn't solve it by going against what these people say. Oh, Poincaré, very important to understand. Actually proved mathematically that there is no closed form solution to the three-body problem. And that's probably why the professional astrodynamicists didn't want to waste time in trying to 